Hello, everyone. Today, I'm speaking with author and psychotherapist Thomas Moore. Um, and Thomas probably doesn't need an introduction to many of you, but uh, he's the author of, I think it's 25 books, uh, Thomas, now? Uh, a little over 30. Ah, there's been a few since I there's checked. Been <laughs> 30 books, and of course, well, Care of the Soul was the the original one I read, but there's been so many more, a religion of one's own, re-enchantment of everyday life, dark night of the soul, many books. And I was thinking this morning, you know, when I wake up as a way of opening, we're going to talk about your story very soon and the influences and the turning points. But as a way of opening, I was thinking, what have I really, you know, like I, I still have your book care of the soul from 25 years ago and it's all tattered and I've got, you know, it, it's kind of falling apart now, but I've taken so much from it, you know, and some of the things, the soul loves depth um, and leads towards depth that um, often in psychology or I remember you said once people sometimes came along to you as a therapist and they wanted to fix things, remove things, eradicate things and, um, you know, but with the soul that, you know, maybe symptoms are more like a, a voice of the soul. That's another thing I took. And the last one was, well, the last one that came to mind this morning was, I think, you know, you turned me on to Ficino and the Neoplatonists. And, and I was very heavily, when I was young, I went to the East a lot, many times. And I kind of thought, you know, West, the Western tradition was, you know, secular materialism and the rational enlightenment and the spirituality was over there in the East. But then there's, you know, the Neoplatonists reminded or, or introduced to a wonderful kind of Western tradition of the sacred. And, and they were pretty cool guys. They weren't narrow in their religion like uh, Ficino. You know, there was... Um, alchemy and astrology and magic and at that time of the renaissance and and i think this western tradition you know you introduced me to so i'm thanking you for all those things from your book over many years and and many more by the way but we were going to start when we talked i think we were going to start from you know some of your main influences and um, turning points and from some of your story. Sure. Um, probably the most uh, uh, most the thing that has impressed me most and still does is spending 13 years as a Catholic monk. Um, that the whole uh, I love that life. That was when I was very young, very young. Mm. And uh, I loved it. And it was a life of study. Uh, we, we considered study to be equivalent to meditation or prayer or anything else that would be part of the spiritual life. Study was part of that. And, and I've, I've maintained that in my life. I, I love to be working on a book because I can study. A book is like a term paper to me, it's something mm. I have to write. And um, so that is part of me, along with the spirituality in it and the uh, the tradition and languages, Latin and Greek especially. Uh, I, I was taking courses and taught in Latin and I was, you know, studying Greek intensely. So those languages have helped me in my later work, surprisingly. It's a different setting, but they really helped me a great deal. Um, I'm very conscious of the fullness of words and the words I'm using. I'm aware of their roots and their stories and their variations and subtleties. Mm -hmm. So that all makes, uh, for a writer, that makes it all very rich. And also following Hillman, who also had, a, he used to say this, he also, that he and I were alike and that we had a similar classical education. Um, there were differences even there, but uh, 
but we we appreciated study and we appreciated language and words and the history of an idea was very important to us. That's how I ground my ideas today when I'm giving talks and writing books. I I make sure that I include the history of an idea and the people yeah. and in conversation with the people who have talked about the same things. I follow Hillman's idea when his last book, The Lament of the Dead, mm. where he talks about how in footnotes that he's not trying to to bolster or support an idea that he's presenting. He's in dialogue with the person who was working on it many years ago or many centuries ago. Mm. I feel that very strongly. That I, I feel very much in, uh, for example, I feel very much in the conversation with uh, Marsilio Ficino from mm. the f late uh, 1400s. And uh, I, I feel a closeness to what he was trying to do. Although I truly don't know who he would be if I were to meet him, but <laughs> I feel a closeness. I think, um, uh, you know, I, when I was saying at the beginning that the soul, you know, you introduced that idea that the soul loves depth, but also that it loves the past. Um, uh, and maybe that's a distinction from, you know, the spirit or spirituality or whatever, but the soul really loves the past and uh, going back into the past of things, maybe. Yes, I call myself a pastist sometimes instead of a futurist because I, I really do love the past and I it's not it's not a kind of a idealis idealization of the past. It's more a, an appreciation for what people have done. I think about people devoting their entire lives to a few ideas. Mm. I feel that I've done that. And I wonder sometimes, you know, I've spent a good deal of my life writing. Yeah. And and it, it takes a lot of time to write books. Mm. When I say I've done over 30 books now, that's a lot of time. Mm. Uh, you know, working on, on uh, ideas in, in my own way. I don't do, do it the way Hillman did it. I do it my own way. Mm. That, by the way, is, a, is something that occurred to me when you were talking originally. I myself have some difficulty um, when I'm speaking in the public to remember that I'm speaking for myself. I'm not a Hillmanian. I don't mm. you know. He is an influence. He was a good friend. Mm. He he was amazing to watch when he performed. Amazing. But we differed in many, many things. Mm. And in, certainly in temperament. And I used to think when I was starting out that I would be kind of an acolyte of Hillman, that I would mm. uh, present his ideas make them intelligible and things like that. But I eventually caught on, and many people told me, too. They advised me. They told me to go my own way. Mm. And uh, so I talk about Hillman with a great deal of respect and fun yeah. and pleasure yeah. because we were very good friends. But at the same time, I'm not a defender of Hillman. I'm, a, I'm my own person. And sometimes when people ask me, to give a talk on Hillman, I'll say no, mm. because I want to say, you know, I've got my own work, and I'm deep into it, mm. and I don't have any more time to explain who he is and what he was doing. Mm. There are a lot of differences. Like, I couldn't imagine him spending 13 years in a monastery for a start. <laughs> uh, I just couldn't see that happening. No, no, he would not do that. No, he, mm. especially a, a Christian monastery. That would drive him crazy. No, you can imagine it. You can't imagine it happening. I don't know why he had this problem about Christianity. I think he missed out on a lot. There are many things that I think he misunderstood because of his bias against uh, Christian philosophy and all that. There's a lot of richness there that he missed. Mm. I was speaking to Rick Tarnas not so long ago, and he said that, that a friend of his had said he was talking with Hillman, and Hillman said, I haven't been writing much lately because um, because I haven't been angry about anything. I know. <laughs> that was one of his lines he wrote from his anger, that Hillman uh, missed out on some things because of his bias against Christian thinkers and writers and mm. stories, all the stories. 
year. And I, you know, one thing I, I think is how do you look back, or or I've asked myself is how do you look back on that time in the monastery now? Do you look back with a, with a lot of um, uh, what uh, you know? Do you think that was a good time in your life? I have mixed feelings. They are about equally good and bad. Mm. So I feel that it was a very rich experience for me. And on the whole, I loved it. I loved mm. that way of life. It was really perfect for me. Mm. I, I had my room that I lived in, my cell, you might say. Yeah. And I loved that privacy and solitude. I had a community there right with me. I didn't have to go looking for people. It was right part of my life, way of life. And I loved that. I was able to have that. I loved the things I learned. I learned a great deal. From the very first day that I left, mm -hmm. I was only 13 years old, and I started learning Latin mm -hmm. and uh, classical ideas and writers. And I, it, I really took to it. I loved it. So all in all, the, there were so many great things that I learned. I was able to study music when I was there. I conducted Gregorian chant for many years. And uh, I wrote music when I was there. I learned how to compose music. I kind of taught myself with books how to, how to write music. Yeah. And I loved that. And um, so all of it was very, very rich. On the other hand, uh, I had to leave my family behind. Mm. And I loved my family. And I have a very warm family, of extended family of many cousins and aunts and uncles and grandparents. And I had to leave all of them to be away from them for a good part of my life, my early life. Um, I don't know if I would do that again. It's too big a price. Um, and uh, also there were a lot of really psychotic uh, leaders in this business. People who rose to the top tend to be deeply disturbed mm. in many ways. And they took out their their uh, confusion, their their emotional confusion on, on me and us. And it was always a struggle to try to be able to maintain your lifestyle in the face of the psychosis mm. that was looking at you in the face. So I, even when I say that, I still feel angry about it. Mm. Um, so that part of it was not easy. and uh, It had its I, shadow, we could say. It had its shadow side. Yeah, it did. For a certain, it had a big shadow. And uh, so uh, when I think about it, I have equally mixed feelings. I, I'm glad I did it because uh, I am who I am because of it. It opened my life up. Yeah, I grew up in a family of plumbers, whom I love, plumbers, yep. uh, in, uh, in a working class part of uh, Detroit, Michigan. And I was in a very narrow life there, you know, my family never traveled. They never, they, they didn't know anything outside their very small world. Very Catholic, very, uh, yeah, very small world. And you got, you got a beautiful a, education, you know, going in there, didn't you? I got a you? beautiful education. I got a great yeah. education from them, certainly. And you know, one thing I think, like from having spent a little bit of time in India, in the, in the ashram, so to speak, that, yeah. It seems to me a bit of remedial training for for the secularization of the world. Like, it's kind of I, I don't quite know how to articulate this, but it's fashionable to say you know now everything is sacred, right? And I get that. Like, I, you know, maybe that's where we're moving to, like an indigenous worldview, and the world is ensouled, and everything is sacred. But I look back at that time as good because of one thing: it's kind of like. It's like a Temenos or something, and it's kind of like you actually separate the sacred and the, the secular. Because I think secular has got into us a lot more than maybe what we think, and that kind of separation with all its downsides, it also had something good in it. Yes. Yes, I think it does. Uh, and um, although I have to say, you know, I think from the very beginning, as early as I can remember, I have been interested in a kind of transcendentalist approach to religion. That's what I'm doing now. I'm writing about the transcendentalists. 
And I realize as I read and write about them that this is really where I, my home, where I, where I live, and maybe even early on. I think the very first publication I ever wrote, the very first thing I ever wrote, simple little essay for a magazine yeah was um, was when i was still quite involved in christianity and i wrote about christianity as a kind of humanism that, I, that was my interest early on was to not not separate the sacred and the religious um and there's a, but there are different ways of doing that and what I've done is I have maintained the religious side quite carefully. I mean, I haven't, I haven't made become wholly secular and say now I have, a, I've said I've made sacred the secular. Mm. I really have maintained my interest in theology. I still call myself a theologian. Just last week, I was at Harvard Divinity School talking to students there, and I, I felt so much at home. Uh, talking theology to these theologians. Yeah. So something about the formal religion that to me is a, is a part of it. You know, I just don't, I don't want to get into a kind of say this is the sacred secular when I really abandon all the religious. I don't want to do that. Mm. I want to remain a theologian, mm. and keep the thoughts in my life. Mm. And, and so that's a special way of doing it. I wonder, you know, maybe that leads us on to this next topic of one of your chapters I like from Care of the Soul, you know, wedding, spirituality and the soul. And they seem like two different things sometimes. You know, when you were saying, talking about the transcendental, it's kind of like the spirit that likes to go high and the soul that likes to go deep. How, how do we live with these two seemingly competing drives sometimes that we have and and how have you done that or attempted to do that i think you have to do it uh as i was just trying to say it's hard to articulate this i, I think you have to do it in a way that you don't make everything a mush um that reminds me of a story if i may break it in break in here and tell you a story yeah. I was giving a talk at a church in Cape Cod one day. This was toward the end of Hillman's life. And um he was in uh he was in his home in Connecticut lying in a hospital bed and confined to the bed at that time. And I, when I was giving this talk, and I gave the talk, and on the way home I had to pass pretty close to where he lived, so I stopped in to see him. And um we were talking as we always did, constantly talking about things and laughing. And uh, I told him, I said, there was a woman at this talk I was just giving in a church. And she stood up and she said, everything I was saying was mush. And uh, Jim said, she's right. Everything we say is mush. <laughs> he said, she's absolutely right. We're just full of mush, to all of us. And we can't seem to get out of it. I expected him to side with me and commiserate, but say instead, that wasn't true at all. What? You... <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't think it was true. But he felt that way. He felt that he was always trying to be clearer, and I think that I think that kind of uh, didn't help him in getting his ideas out into the world. But you know, it's kind of like. It's easy to go one way or the other, isn't it? The soul of that you can go that way a little and that ends up in a bit of mush sometimes if you kind of go down there deep enough. But then it's um, that, that kind of, what is it, that loftiness of the spirit. Um, we seem to need a bit of both somehow. And, and uh, as distinct from the mush, it seems to me that you're making a distinction. That, you know, you keep on making a distinction between the spirit and the soul, which is helpful, if you ask me, but That's not easy to live with. That's what I'm trying to say. As I say, it's difficult to articulate. What I want to say that if you want to have spirit and soul in your life, both, you have to, you can't just let, the, let either side just be unconscious. You have to work at it. So I work at theology, not not a Christian theology, but 
theology in general. You know, that's I'm a gen generic theologian, mm -hmm. and not related to any particular tradition. But I may be talking the Buddhist theology at one moment, and I might be talking something else at another, Greek polytheistic theology. So, um, I but I think it's really important to be specific and to have studied and know what you're talking about if you want instead of just make it vague everything vague then you do get mush and how did you get on to jung and 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 then maybe for china how did that all happen well that that was all at syracuse i um i had studied uh when I left the monastery, I, I thought I'd be a musician because I was so involved in music. Um, and I finished my a degree in music and I got a second degree, a master's degree from Michigan, which was a wonderful place to study. But then I realized that this wasn't satisfying me. I kept wanting to do theology. So I went to the University of Windsor in, in Canada and got a, de a degree, a master's degree in theology. And a professor there told me that I should get a PhD in religion. And I told him that's the last thing I wanted. You know, I, I was finished with religion. I left religion when I left the monastery. Mm. It wasn't just that monastery, it was the whole, the whole thing I left. Mm. And I couldn't imagine myself studying religion. And he said, well, why don't you just explore it and see what you think? So uh, I looked over the program at Syracuse and it looked quite interesting to me. And I... That they, uh, I wrote to them saying I'd like to apply, and they said, "If you, why don't you write a paper, like a ten-page paper, telling us how you think religion ought to be studied?" So I wrote the paper, and as a result, they gave me free tuition and a living ex living stipend, and they gave me everything. They, they liked it. Years. They gave me a PhD essentially, <laughs> and. My first my first day at Syracuse was enlightening to me because. I thought I knew what I wanted to study, but I the world opened up my first day there. I realized what I didn't know, and I had so much to learn. I knew I would never learn enough in three years. And my first seminar with David Miller, who knew Hillman at the time and, and knew Jung quite well, uh, David assigned the collective works of Jung as a reading for that, for that seminar. And so I read the 18 volumes of Jung's works. There are 20, but two of those are index and bibliography. So I read the 18 volumes, which is a lot, about 600 pages each, and very, very erudite and full of philosophy and history, alchemy. Um, so I read all that, and I just ate it up. I loved it. But David in, uh, introduced me to Hillman by correspondence. So I began corresponding with Elman. And he would send me the pieces he was writing as he published them, little off prints he would send me. And they were very important to me because they brought Jung to life. I had troubles with Jung, with Jung's ideas. And uh, Hillman resolved them for me. And he was very dedicated to Jung and knew Jung better than anybody I know. And it's funny because the Jungians didn't like him at first. They really, I, I had a great trouble myself just being his friend. Oh, my Jungian <laughs> friends are so good. And uh, so, uh, but I was convinced. He got that, you into trouble by default. He did, he did. <laughs> but I, I loved Jung. I loved Jung very much. I still, when I write now, I'm not in my writing studio here now. I'm just in a little room in our house, but... I have Jung's collective works over my shoulder. I mean, with in inches so that I can just grab the index of his collective works. Mm. And if I want to write about anything, I look and find out what he said. I think he it was full of wonderful information. I don't mm. like his, I never liked his systematizing of his ideas. You know, all the shadow and persona and anima and the self well, and all of that. I didn't like that. I think, you know, when, when you talk about the Neoplatonists, how they put the soul at the centre of things, you know, whereas sometimes it seems to me that in a bit of unionism that's come later, it's just 
shadow, anima, animals. And there's, there's not always a lot about the soul sometimes. Whereas I don't see Jung like that himself, but it's kind of how it's been, you know, taken. That's since then. what I feel. And uh, about three or four years ago, I wrote a, maybe it was only two years ago, I wrote a piece for a, a book on the Red Book uh, edit, edited by Murray Stein. Yeah. Who's a really, really highly respected Jungian. And um, I was glad that he asked me to write for him one of his books because I, I, I'm happy when Jungians accept me. <laughs> uh, and uh, I wrote about Jung the Magus, the magician, rather than Jung the psychologist, because I felt that there's a side of Jung that is not where he doesn't do his psychology thing and psychiatrist thing. And I think he's much better when he gets away from that psychiatrist identity. And uh, he has so much of interest to say. And it's very subtle. And it doesn't go into all of these definitions and classifications. You can't you can't make an outline of it on a blackboard. You know, that's, you can do that with Jungian theory, but you can't do it with his insights into life and his m magical side. So if I could ask a, a naughty question here, what, what, how did you, what's your take on Edward Edinger's maps and, uh, you know, all of that system? Do you like that? You know, I'm, I'm not, no, I'm not too interested in that. All I have to say, I appreciate what he did. And yeah. I think that. He, he moved it a little bit, you know? He didn't just stick to Jung's ideas, he added his own. Yeah. And um, and I think that can be useful. I learned a lot from him. I read his books and he helped me yeah. to get away from his language, to open it a bit and be able to, to see it more as a living thing rather than a theory. I think that helped. Even though he was theorizing, he opened it somewhat, broke it open a bit, and that helped me a lot. Yeah. This ego self axis, you know, that really yeah. was different language for for Jung's idea of the transcendent function, which is really hard to grasp as far as I can tell. Mm. And uh, this <laughs> ego self axis was easy to grasp, and I like that. And it's not always, you know, when you read Jung sometimes, like he takes so many big leaps in such a hurry that it's not always easy to, you need someone to break him down a bit, you know? No, he can be very dense. And uh, no, I think a lot of the times, I think neither he nor I knew what he was writing about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, on to the, the Neoplatonists. Like, how did that all come about and your love for Ficino, which which comes well, through so much of you really. This is this is strange because it, it all goes back to the fact that I had been studying music at Michigan uh, not long before I went to Syracuse. So I had that still in my mind. I was studying music. I was a musicologist. I was studying musicology and composition at Michigan, which is one of the great schools for music and very difficult to get into. And I felt so lucky to be in that school and surrounded by excellent musicians everywhere I looked. And um, so I was very involved in that. And at Syracuse, Gabriel Bahanian was head of the graduate department at the time. I don't know if you know of him, but he okay. was a death of God theologian and he was a very tough guy, very tough. And he, 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 uh, he was very strict and strict in his thinking too. So one day he called me in and he said, you better get a topic for your dissertation or we'll have to kick you out of here. I mean, he wasn't usually subtle about his idea. <laughs> and uh, so I went right to the library and this, these were the days of library rather than computers. Mm -hmm. I went to the library and I loved it there. I was walking through, this is one of these stories a lot of people tell, I was walking through the music section not not psychology or not religious studies. I was in the music section because that's where I felt at home at that time. Mm -hmm. And I looked up way on the top shelf, I could hardly reach, and I saw this series of black books. And I pulled one down from the middle of it and opened it up at random. 
I wasn't trying to do that. I just did it, you know, sort of without thinking. And I opened it up to this article by D.P. Walker, who was an historian uh, over at the in London at the Warburg Institute, where they were studying uh, interesting, you know, natural magic and uh, in Italian 15th century. And he wrote this article about Marsilio Ficino. And he quoted a paragraph in the very first part of the very beginning of his article, which says, essentially said that there are two things in the world, mind and body, and they have no way of being connected to each other unless there is a soul between them. And I thought, whoa, that was like a lightning bolt to me. Mm that how soul was this intermediary between thinking and maybe feeling or thinking mm -hmm. interior life and external exterior life. I thought, wow, that, I've never thought of it that way before. I better find out about this guy, Ficino. As I read further in, in D.P. Walker's article, I discovered that Ficino used music in his uh, work and he, he, he used music in his vocabulary. And I thought, whoa, this is pretty good. And then I found out he was an astrologer. And I was interested in astrology. We, we, had you been into astrology for a little while before then? Or? Uh, yeah, a little bit, mainly at Syracuse, because uh, my fellow classmates there were interested in all kinds of weird things, you know, all kinds mm. of, uh, you know, unusual areas. And uh, like one of my classmates was a sp specialist in William Blake's poetry. Wrong. And another was big on the Kabbalah and someone else. I know they were all doing different things, alchemy and all these things, specializing in them. It and, wasn't exactly like a vocational career track, was it? Like, you know, how, how to get ahead in the secular world. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, nobody was doing that as a way to get a job, that's for sure. <laughs> But we loved it, and we, I learned more from my, in some ways, more from my fellow students than from the faculty. Right. They were so smart, and they were so gifted, and had these interests that I, I and and I, I, I remember taking a course one day when, we, I took a wonderful course from one of my professors, Stanley Hopper, who was, who was old at the time, and just a classic wise old man. Mm. And, uh, and Stanley gave this uh, course on knowledge as memory as memory as remembering a course a seminar on knowledge as memory and it was amazing and one of my classmates gave a presentation to the seminar on nicholas of cusa who was a, a 15th century philosopher in germany who mm -hmm. wrote magnificent books really and he's one of my great heroes now but i i discovered this whole area of, of of interest to me, Nicholas of Cusa through one of my classmates. So I had so much to learn, so much to learn. I just, I was overwhelmed, mm -hmm. not from what was the work given me, but by the things I was discovering I had. They were discovered. opening up in front of you, basically. They were opening up all over. So when I took this book about Ficino, one of the things I discovered quickly was that very little had been written about him and he hadn't been translated. And his most interesting book to everybody who wrote, a, I read about, uh, was called uh, I, I don't. It was called De Vita Celitus Comparanda in Latin, which means uh, and how to uh, uh, how to uh, design your life according to the sky, the planets. Mm. And there was an astrological work, but it was about really a psycho psychological astrology how to design your life, how to live your life according to the planets. Mm. So I, that was that was so attractive to me, I couldn't believe it. So what I had to do, because it had not been translated, I had to sit down and translate this book from Latin first before I did anything else. Was that a big and, job? Well, the Latin of that period is very different from the Latin that I studied when I was studying philosophy in Latin. Mm. Thomas Aquinas wrote very almost like child's writing. And uh, Ficino wrote very, very complex uh, Latin. So it was not easy to translate. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did it. I translated the whole thing. But I knew that I wasn't good enough to publish the translation. So I just used it as a translation for my dissertation. Mm -hmm. 
I still have it. I still refer to it because I, I like it better than the translations that have come out. And um, so I I, uh, I got fired up about Ficino and I found that it wasn't difficult to make the move from doing a depth analysis, like a psychoanalysis, uh, uh, based on Ficino's astrology. And uh, so I, I had to think, I had to really... First of all, I had to translate this stuff and really get it clear in my mind. It takes a long time to translate that difficult to Latin. And I really, so it really got into me. I really, I knew it firsthand. You know, I really knew what he was saying because I had to work so hard at the translation. And uh, so, sorry. Yeah. Then I translated that into a psychological world. It just seems to me that, you know, I, I don't know, like, at university, you know, I remember going to uni and Adam Smith was the main man or whatever, you know, the wealth of nations, like economics and all of that. But it, it's kind of like the the, the thing about someone like Ficino is that it uh, it's not just the scholarship, but it's that interest in the arts and astrology and the breadth of the whole thing. Uh, tremendous, tremendous yeah. breadth. He was so intelligent and well-read. He was tra he translated a tremendous amount of work mm. from Greek to Latin, and uh, I like Plotinus and the Corpus Hermeticum, the magical text. He translated all of that. That's a lot. I mean, read Plotinus today, read the Aeneas, and you find out how difficult that is in terms of thought and language, and long, very long. And he translated and wrote commentaries on Plotinus as well. And he, he wrote about the uh, students of Plotinus, Porphyry and Iamblichus, who are very interesting people also who were around Plotinus, who wrote about things that were fascinating to Ficino, and even today very fascinating. And uh, so he, he, he was a, an, an amazing scholar, and uh, he practiced magic. He, you know, there's, there's magic in Plotinus. Uh, they call it... Uh, Oh, what do they call it? I better forget now. They call it something else. But it's there's magic in the, the work of Plotinus, who was the main author behind uh, Soul, you know, the work of Soul, the follower of Plato. And um, so Ficino had not only translated all that, Plotinus, he, uh, he wrote commentaries on it. And he wrote commentaries, I don't remember the word now, theurgy, they call it instead of magic, theurgy. It's like a liturgy of the divine, theo, theos, theurgy. And um, so he, he wrote about these things and then he practiced it. He didn't just write about it. He, he put into practice this very interesting way of doing what I would call therapy, but he called, I don't know what he called it. Uh, he just thought as a way of working with people, like if they were depressed, he would help them with his theurgy. And it might mean uh, it might mean going for a walk in a certain environment, or it might be like going to the ocean, or he might recommend uh, eating eating certain foods or having playing some, some playing some music if you were a little Saturnian. That's right, playing some music could you lift your it. spirits. That's right. <laughs> the, the way he put it, he, the way he said it himself was that if you, if you're sad, play some Venusian music to cheer you up, but if you really want to deal with your sadness, play Saturnine music. <laughs> That's funny. It's homeopathic. You know, it's going with the symptom instead of against it. So in a way, you've brought that into how you started to, well, we're jumping ahead maybe, but when you were beginning to practice psychotherapy, it was a little homeopathic, wasn't it? That was your form of... Oh, it was. It was. Yeah. I... I got that from Ficino and somewhat from Jung, certainly from Hellman. So when I started practicing therapy, this was after teaching in a university for about seven years until they fired me. And uh, and I, I started practicing therapy. Well, I had for my resources, I had Ficino, Jung, and Hillman mainly. I also, when I was at Syracuse at the university there, I did a minor 
a minor emphasis in uh, counseling psychology. So I had had a lot of uh, study and uh, practical, uh, what do you call it, supervised work as a therapist at Syracuse. I didn't intend to become a therapist then, but I thought it would, I felt that teaching was part therapy. And I felt if I knew more about, had some skills in counseling psychology, I could teach better. So that's really my motive, was my motive to study counseling psychology. But it allowed me to get a, a license to practice then when I uh, uh, left teaching. Mm. And when did you start to write? Like, I missed The Planets Within uh, for some time. Like, I only read that a few years ago out, out of many of your books. But I think I learned a lot more from about you from that than perhaps some of the That's others fine. even. That was really a, a complete rewrite of my dissertation. Wow. Uh, so I wrote the dissertation on Ficino, and I completely, I mean, I started over and rewrote it as a book. I didn't, I didn't want to make it sound like a dissertation. Yeah. I wanted to make it a real book, so I rewrote it. And that, I think, is, if I'm not mistaken, it was in the mid-70s. It must have been 1976 or seven that I... I rewrote that book and published it in 80, 82, something like it's that. Your first, it's your first book, isn't it, really? It... Well, I'm trying to remember. I think the, the Dallas Institute published a little collection, a very tiny little pamphlet collection of uh, essays or talks I had given there. That wow. was really my first book, a little book. It was a very tiny pamphlet, really. Yeah. And... Um, I guess that's true that uh, the first book I wrote was uh, The Planets Within, yeah. First published, first published book, yeah. What, one thing I like about it is, you know, I don't know a lot about astrology, but the idea that the within aspect, the, the you know, Saturn as, a, a, as an aspect of, of the psyche or Venus as an aspect of the, yeah. of the yeah. psyche, um, that makes a lot of I can I can relate to that very strongly, and I, I think when one this is just a backyard theory I have well I don't know what you think but when one is young and a bit poor and idealistic and uh, flying, perhaps there's this idea that the world shouldn't have any Saturn. You know that uh, it, the world would be a nice place if it just didn't have any Saturn at all. But somehow aging is about coming to terms with Saturn and the the old man or the old woman, I guess. Yeah, it's very rich. And it's psychologically much more, much more useful than most modern psychology. By far, really, by far. So, uh, I, you know, I've never really been a practicing astrologer. Uh, as a therapist, I very frequently will discuss a person's birth, birth chart with them. But I'm not one to look at all the transits and know what's coming along and make predictions. It's not, I just don't have that mind to do that. And sometimes I wish I did, but I don't. And so I don't try. But I do the astrology the way I write about it and the planets within. I, I think astrologically. I always say in my lectures that uh, for the the last 500 years is the only time in human history that we haven't lived under meaningful sky, under a sky that had meaning for us, that we saw ourselves in it. Mm. It's a great deprivation that we have done a, this. A great disenchantment as well. A disenchantment, absolutely. Disenchanted the world, really taken the psyche out of the sky, and we're left with this place that we send rockets to. It's it's so absurd. All that money we're putting into sending people up there and say, oh, look at those rocks. Mm. You know, it's just, it, it's useless as far as I can see. It has disenchanted the planets. And they used to be a source of meaning for human life. And now they're just, uh, it's like a travelogue. You say, oh, that's what Mars looks like. Then you go on with your life. Yeah. Uh, a lack of cosmos, which is not a very poetic way of saying it, but but how? how but what about the the old and the new, you know, or the old man and the youth, or 
because that's a bit of a paradox too, isn't it? Like how to live with both of those. Like that's a bit. Uh, uh, how do you do it? How do you do it? Uh, well, I follow the principle, you know, that um, you Ficino says this very clearly. Mm. He gives the example of the judgment of Paris when Paris had to choose between three goddesses and he chose one and then the Trojan War began. Ficino says when you're faced with three choices, always choose all three. And that's what I do. I choose every. I choose everything. And I live the polytheism of it. And that may be difficult at times, but it's more enriching and useful. And I think more, more realistic to live polytheistically rather than to have to make choices all along. So you, you so with youth, with age, mm. uh, you live both all the time. Uh, and maybe, you know, some days I might feel pretty old and some days I feel pretty young. My dad was my example. He was he lived to be a hundred, and um, he was extremely young uh, on his hundredth birthday. He was like a kid, a child, mm -hmm. and he loved it. He loved his birthday party, and he was alert and greeting ever all the relatives and friends that came to to be at his party, and um, so. I, f I feel I to take my my example from him that he was able to be old and young always. Yeah. And he complained. He told me once. He said I he said I was never able to grow up. It took me a long time to grow up. He thought that was a great failing. I think. <laughs> but on the other hand, it was it's what allowed him to remain so alive and mm -hmm. alert and engaged when he was a hundred. Maintained the uh, uh, his youthful vigor and spirit. Yes, so I think there are times when you might slip into one or the other. You know, Hillman wrote about this in the very beginning of his career, the Puer Senex. That was his. He he couldn't shake it. It was something that really was important to him. He yeah. wrote several essays about it, and he kept talking about it. You know, when he was older, he never let that go kept talking about Puer Senex. It was a big thing for him. I don't think, I don't think everyone who followed him had, were, were, was so um, excited. Ena uh, enamored with that topic as perhaps he was. That's right. That's yeah. right. And what about Venus? You know, uh, uh, oh, just one other thing I want to say, though. Before we leave Saturn, I, I see, to me, that ties in with, you know, when you talk about the gifts of depression or, or melancholy, that we don't always see the positive side of Saturn, though, either, do we? The old or the, 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 the melancholic or whatever, that, you know, perhaps that gifts can come from that too, that, that, that study or that deepening or... Yes. Piccino wrote about this. You know, the other book, the book I mentioned, De Vita Celitus, is a his third volume of a three-volume work. Yeah. And in the earlier volumes, the earlier volumes, volumes, he wrote about what happens to people when they read too much or study. Mm. And he recommends that the people wear white clothes when they read because it's 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 too easy to fall into that Saturnine darkness and depression. Uh, so he, he had all kinds of recommendations, what to eat and how to spend your time to offset the uh, the impact of Saturn, especially on the people who thought a lot, there were thinkers and readers. It's kind of a, a, an occupational hazard for scholars. Is, it it is. put it that way? Yeah. Yeah, it is, certainly. It is for me. You know, that's what I was saying. I spent a, a, my, all this time as a writer and that means I was studying the whole time and reading a lot as well as writing. Mm. I'm working with words all the time. I'm sitting constantly. It's not supposed to be good for your health, you know, but there I am. And so um, uh, I think you know, it's something that uh, you have to be okay with. Uh, I know writers who are not okay with it and they regret spending all that time writing. I don't. I, mm. To me, it's exciting and it's very active. And, it's where I feel most at home. And not only that, but it has brought me into the world. It has opened up a big world for me. Mm. People even today 
are reading me all over the world. Yeah, they're reading books everywhere. I just, I just. It, it must be a lovely thing, you know, in 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 a very nice way. I just heard from Bulgaria and Latvia in the past week. Mm. People telling me we have so many readers here mm. reading your book. We want to make sure we have the good translations for you. We would help. They like your guidance on it. And mm. I'm thinking, you know, I, I I never thought of that. I didn't know that Bulgarians and Latvians are reading my books, and I wish I could talk to them. Yeah. And a few months ago, I gave a talk uh, online in Moscow, and I just loved talking to the Russians there. It was so wonderful. It's like a mm. thrill for yeah. me to get to talk to a big audience of, uh, of Russian people. When you, were, so, when, when you were in the monastery, Tom, you probably weren't thinking that it was going to pan out like that. Or one other thing I could maybe say is... Did it freak you out a little? You know, didn't you go on Oprah uh, show or something to speak about care of the soul? I mean, did that time freak you out a little from that person who was what a, a contemplative mystic for thirteen years, and then all of a sudden the world must have changed quite a bit. It did change, and uh, I've done a lot of that. When I first, when care of the soul first came out, I was on television shows a lot. You know, these three minute. Yeah, uh, slots where I could talk about my books, and I did a lot of that, a lot, and uh, and then I went on Oprah at the beginning, and then just about four years ago, I was on her show again, and I, but you know, I when I did that, like talking to Oprah, um, I like I I like her very much, and it was easy for me to sit there with her and forget about the cameras, and just talk with her because she was interested and she had very good questions and was a thoughtful person, very present to the point where I, she's someone I really would like to be a friend of, you know, she was so, such a wonderful person. And, um, and we got on so well mm -hmm. and uh, we went on uh, for a long, far longer than we were supposed to hours beyond what we were supposed to. And um, so, if I can get into that space with all of the hoopla, you know, around uh, the media, if I can get into that space and really see the person I'm talking to and be with them, uh, it's not too different from doing therapy. Right. Yeah, and she has and she has soul in your language, you know, yeah, or any anyone's yeah. language really. Yeah, that's right. And what about Venus? I know I've got a bit of a checklist here, and I'm sorry to jump around from one thing to the other, but right. I like it. What? Um, how does Venus operate in your life? And and you know, I, I just want to say something which is a bit more backyard psychology. We'll see how <laughs> you like it, but uh, I, I'm often you know fascinated between the difference between you and Hilma. You know, because some we were speaking before we before we started recording, but some of your ideas are, are similar. You know, even though you're very much your own people, right? But your styles and the way of approaching seems to me to be so much different. And, and I expect Hillman to be provocative, Aries. You know, he shakes up your fixed ideas or something. But I would think you've got a bit more Venus or something, a bit more. It's like he destroys people and you build them back up again after he just destroyed some of their main ideas, something like that. That's true. That's true. But Hillman had a lot of Venus in him and he was very devoted to Venus. That's true as well, yeah. One thing we did when we were living in Dallas together, there was a, I don't know if you know Neiman Marcus, a really very big, it's a very big uh, expensive uh, department store. Yeah. And there was headquarters in Dallas. I don't think it was well known in the country, but in Dallas, it was big. And every, uh, well, twice a year, they would have a big sale. They were so expensive, we would never go otherwise. Yeah. But um, but he and I would go shopping there when they had the sales. And that was really quite an interesting thing for me, to go into a department store with him and go into the men's department and look at clothes. And uh, I remember the first time we went, he said, 
he said, no, he said, we're going to go into the store and there'll be shirts and other things there. And he said, don't choose anything. Let them choose you. You you take home the shirts that have chosen you. I said, well, that's not good to me. Let's give it a try. <laughs> and uh, And he would go and get these very colorful things. He would get a bright green, brilliant green shirt with a pink tie. And he'd look at me and said, you know, I'd say, this is what's chosen me, I'd say. And I'd say, well, I'm glad it didn't choose me. Got you, but I, you know, I'm glad I don't have to go on with it. Um, he was very drawn to, and that's how he understood Venus, that Venus was the aesthetic, intense aesthetic presence of an object. I think he, he never used that, that phrase, but I think that's what he was saying. Mm. It's the intense presentation of an object, individual object. And uh, so I think that's where his Venus was, that he he did live in a very sensuous world in, in his own way. Yeah. In his own way. And, he, uh, he's and, often, what's the word, maybe caricatured a little when, in the sense of the, the softer, kinder, the, the, the person who loves beauty. You know, they're all so much a part of Hillman too, yes. aren't they? And it's the display, funny. the display of beauty, like the animal, you know, the, the that's right, the display. He loved that, yeah. Mm. So, so for him, an an object was like an animal. It was like, it was like, uh, you know, it's funny. It makes me think of something. Go going back to my conversation about Ficino when I was translating him. One day, I came across a sentence. Uh, it's it said mundus. Animal est. Very simple, Ed. Uh, the world is an animal. And I wondered, I said, is that, I wonder if that's what he meant, because there are a lot of typos in these old uh, manuscripts. And I thought maybe it, it, that could be if the L wasn't there, just anima, it would mean the world has a soul. Animal est is a construction, a, a possessive meaning it has. Mm -hmm. So it could be the world has a soul. And um, I, I, I thought about it for a long time, which way I should translate it. And I finally came to the conclusion, and I know I'm quite sure of it, that he meant that the world is an animal. Mm. And I think that was Hillman's idea too, that everything in the world was like an animal or an animal to him. So those shirts were animals. They weren't just objects. They were animals that were... And even the shirts speak to you. And the ties and the cap he had, which said there's a, he used to wear around, there's no fool like an old fool. Maybe that spoke to him too. Yes. <laughs> but, what about, and, but what about with you, with Venus? Do you know, tell me some of the other ways that that planet within operates in your life. You know? Well, the obvious one would be sexuality, where I was, you know, I lived the first 13 years of my life how would I say, life, you know, from my teens. From my teens to 26, I lived under the vow of chastity, mm -hmm. meaning that, you know, I didn't have a sexual life and in the usual sense, act, you know, not no partners and that kind of thing. Um, and I didn't, I had no trouble with that. I saw it as part of the whole system and I didn't feel deprived. I felt pretty good, and uh, and uh, so, but it did affect me. I think it did affect me so that uh, when I was older and I got married, and uh, I became a therapist, and there's so much sexuality in therapy. Um, I felt very. I've always felt quite comfortable uh, with when sex comes up in therapy. And, I have felt very comfortable with the whole thing. So Venus has been my friend. I'm aware that in my chart, Venus is on the midheaven as she often appears. And, uh, but I feel her there. That means be at the very top of the circle. And it's like, she's out there. It's like, it's my way. It's, it's my way is to have the Venusian out there. So when I write a book, I want it to be Venusian. I, I pay attention to mm. uh, if there's any way I can make it more beautiful, I'll do that. 
Mm. Beauty is a very important aspect of it. And uh, I like talking and writing about sexuality. I feel like I have something to say about it. And I think having had that vow of chastity helped me. <laughs> it gave me a, a view of all sides of, of this thing. And uh, mm. I don't feel repressed from it. And uh, I feel basically, I think there are some wounds from it for sure, just being a Catholic that you get sexual wounds. Mm. But uh, in general, I came off pretty well, especially being in the monastery with with that vow. Mm. And uh, what is your star sign again? What did it, again, I'm not an expert on this, but you're a, a Libra, aren't you? And that, isn't that ruled by ruled by Venus? Yes, it is. Yeah, Libra is, is ruled by Venus, so that makes it even stronger. Yeah. Yeah. Venus is strong, and also, if I'm not mistaken, I'm trying to remember, Venus is in a sign at the midheaven. She's in a sign that it, she rules, so it's very strong. Yeah, I can oh, see that come through. And you know, when you talk about writing, uh, meaning letter writing and, and longhand writing and things like that, you yeah. know, that love of the beauty comes through. Yeah, I, although I never do that. Not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I love I love writing. I, I learned how to type when I was a teenager, and uh, I can type very fast. And so I'm very happy to be able to write fast, write mm. these books quickly. Mm. Um, it would be hard if I had to struggle at it. I know we're getting you know we're getting on and maybe going over a little, but I, I have a couple of quick questions to ask you. Is one thing I heard Jung say which I liked, but I've never really understood, and I think you put in one of your books, that the work begins in Mercurius and ends, you know, with Mercury. Oh, yes, right, right. It sounds true to me, but what does it actually mean? <laughs> well, I think what it means is that uh, uh, Hermes or Mercury, Hermes and Mercury are pretty well identical. Mm. Uh Hermes and Mercury would be the god of a uh, of form, of language, of uh, cleverness, creativity, all that whole combination of things that, uh, so that if you want to be involved in an alchemical process, let's say a certain part of your life, you see it alchemically, something developing in your life, what you'll notice, I think, is that the spirit at the beginning is one of creativity and of having to work out new ideas, to be inventive, to solve problems early on. Uh, it's all Mercury. It's all Hermes at the beginning. It's not really about Venus, you know, making everything beautiful and, mm. and uh, being part of nature and all. It's not really... That's not a. That's not the time of beginnings. Beginnings is more uh, imagining and uh, yeah, picturing the future for you and that sort of thing. It's what Jung described very well when he wrote about the child archetype. He called it um, as a time of beginnings. Mm -hmm. So I think that's why Jung would say that the alchemical process begins in Mercurius or uh, Hermes, and it ends in Mercury because uh, the way he puts it, of course, he quotes a famous line from the Middle Ages that my end is my beginning. Mm. So when you come to the end, you start over and your end becomes the material for the beginning. And there has to be this elision, this, this passage from the end of one thing to the beginning of another. That is very mercurial to work that out and it's mercurial to even talk about it. My end is my beginning. It's kind of a paradox. Mm -hmm. So that paradox would be very much in the realm of Mercury. It's, it's, it's a way of thinking that you gain something by its, by its juxtaposition, by the way it's formed and shaped, and how mysterious it is, not by getting a good idea, but by being struck by the paradox. Uh, Hermes also teaches through surprise. So if you are surprised at something that you're reading, 
uh, that is that is the mercurial, the Hermes aspect of your reading. And uh, so, or awakened, we talk about awakening. I was awakened by reading this book. Well, that's that's Mercury. He wakes people up and puts them to sleep. And you don't mention, it seems to me, you don't mention the, the trickster much, but, you know, it's no. a little similar, isn't it? Hermes, there's an trickster. element. There's an element of trickster, but I think it probably is a mistake to equate the trickster with Hermes. Right. Trickster is a little different, but there are obvious some similarities between them. But I would I would say they're not the same figure really. They share some some aspects. Yeah. It seems to me in the present environment we were talking just before we started, and you know it's such a uh, what's the word? Some people call it the culture wars, and it's a strong environment binary clash earnest and uh um not much of that mercurial surprise uh you know that that approach you know i often say that one of the big problems with modern life is that we have so little wit we don't have much wit you know like politicians are so flat they don't really have wit they try to be witty and they doesn't mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. you know, they just don't have it in them. They don't have the spirit of Mercury to be able to do it. And if anyone needs Mercury, it's a politician. Um, so we don't have it in our world. I try to be witty and giving talks and people just stand and sit there, you know, with stone faces sometimes. <laughs> That's like when I tell jokes. That happens. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's, no, I know time. what you mean. And I think you know, fundamentalism maybe too. Like there's a lot of ideology, a lot of fundamentalism around, which is unfortunate because it's it, it, it's harsh. It's harsh and heavy and dull, yeah. Boring perhaps is, is maybe one of the biggest and oh, the worst, worst things you can say. Yeah. There's no mercury in it to bring lighten things up. Mm. You know, mercury, they say, the, the most... Uh, Hermes, the most uh, uh, outstanding quality is that he is a guide of souls. Guide meaning he actually guides you around. He's a guide of souls. He takes you where you need to go. Mm. It's like you see him just been guiding Dante down into the inferno. He's a guide. He takes people where they need to go, it takes the soul. And uh, so we need, we need Hermes. Without him, we don't have the benefits of soul. Right. And I've got one last question for you. Carl Jung said something along the lines, one has to find one's myth. You know, what myth is one living? What are your favourite myths? Or, or uh, you know, I was thinking, well, you know, polytheism, maybe you can't just have one favourite myth, but... Uh, uh, yeah, really. Maybe you have to have a few, but I'm wondering, you know, when you go back to a myth again and again, do you, do you, is there one that stands out to you? Well, I have to say that uh, when I'm giving talks, the the, uh, the mythic figure I like most to talk about is Hermes. I was just talking about him and I enjoy that. I enjoy him as a figure. Um. In terms of stories, there's so many. I have been drawn to the Artemis, stories around Artemis and to the young men around Artemis. Uh, the story of Acteon appealed to me, and I wrote an article for Hillman once for a book that he published. I wrote an article on Acteon, who was a young man who saw Artemis taking a bath, and she turned him into a deer. And he was torn apart by his dogs. That That story is always... Uh, charmed me. I wondered about what's going on. It's not that it's a happy story, but it's one that I recognize somehow. I feel that when I was a monk, I was doing the Acteon thing. I was trying to see the goddess somehow. I was trying to, you know, we called it God, but I was probably Artemis was God, part of God that I was looking for. And I was trying to see, to find God. And I was kind of, it was a, it was a, disturbing experience to do that at that time. But I do feel a closeness. Uh, for example, the uh, the play Hippolytus by Euripides, 
which is about a young man who, whom uh, Aphrodite causes to fall in love with his stepmother. And um, so his uh, stepfather, his father comes in and uh, kills him. It's a pretty tragic story of a young man uh, being too, too devoted to Artemis, too pure, and not willing to worship at the altar of Aphrodite. And that's where I was, I think, in my early years. And so stories of Artemis, it's not that I love reading them, but I'm drawn to them because I think that deep down they do represent a deep story narrative that has been going on in me, not out of my choice, but just happening. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And, you know, uh, I want to thank you. And also I know that so many people have taken so much from your work and your books and your deep thinking about the soul and always um, taking us back towards the soul. So uh, thanks very much. Well, thank you. This is a really good conversation and it's not often I have a chance to talk this way to get into it uh, deeply. And uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to have done that. And I thank you for it.